So up to this point, I've been talking about the origins of flight, the physics of flight, um, feathers as the primary means of flight, and then other adaptations that birds exhibit for flight. <clears throat> and that all leads up to the most um, Herculean effort that many birds engage in, the most marvelous aspect of flight that most birds engage in, and that is migration. And here are three books that I highly recommend on the subject. All three of them are written for a popular audience. And so, um, get my pointer here. Scott Wiedensall has written a couple of them here. Uh, Living on the Wind, I absolutely love. Um, his second book, uh, or the subsequent book, A World on the Wing, um, is, is very good. And then Ken Kaufman has written about um, spring migration up where he lives in the uh, upper United States. And so if you are intrigued and want to learn more, then I highly recommend these three books written for a popular audience. Here are just a few examples of the amazing long distance journeys that some species engage in. And so, um, for example, you see Swainson's hawks that they'll actually breed up here in Canada and they will overwinter all the way down here in the Pampas. Um, but then you have even longer migrations of things like short-tailed shearwaters here um, that go to Australia and then go back up to their breeding grounds around Alaska. And then take a look at the red line. That's the Arctic tern, a bird that goes from pole to pole, North Pole to South Pole, breeds up here and then overwinters, but winter is relative because they go during the Antarctic summer. Um, they go down here to the South Pole, and this bird engages in the longest migration of any species um, that is known. And so these are just incredible natural feats, and people have been intrigued by this ever since ancient times, and so um, that's going to be the topic uh, for today. The term migration has a specific meaning in ornithology that is not the same meaning that other types of biology may use. In ornithology, it is a journey that is round trip, a journey and return. It's a regular movement that usually corresponds to the seasons as opposed to just any old time. And it generally occurs between where you breed and where you don't. And that don't season is often winter. So this map, for example, here for just a hypothetical bird, this is the same kind of map that you see in your field guides where you have your breeding range and the bird's non-breeding range depicted in uh, different colors. And so you can see that these are spatially disjunct areas. And so the, the bird has to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and it undertakes this journey. It was hatched in the breeding area. It goes and spends its first winter down in its wintering area. And then in its first season as an adult, it goes back up to that breeding area. And so migration is this journey and return. This term is also used um, in entomology, for example. Talk about like migration in monarchs. It's not the same individuals that's making those journeys and return. There's multiple generations. So just be advised that the term migration as used by ornithologists is not necessarily the same as used by the general public or by um, other biological disciplines. In addition, there are certain terms that are often confused with migration um, or that are types of migration that I want you to be able to distinguish. And so I've, I've um, color coded them differently. Um, the first term is dispersal which in ornithology means it's a one-way movement by juveniles to establish their own adult territory. And so, like you see, the, the parents saying goodbye to the junior who is leaving the nest here. Um, so that is not a journey and return. That's a journey. Dispersal is used um, in other disciplines as well. Sometimes, like in entomology, confusingly, they use dispersal to often mean what we would call a journey and return. As somebody who works has one foot in the world of ornithology and one foot in the world of entomology, I find this 
fascinating and frustrating at the same time. Anyway, dispersal in ornithology means um, the juveniles leave home. Then we have certain species that engage in what's called partial migration, which means that part of the population migrates, so certain individuals migrate, but others don't. And so examples of this um, are American robins and white crowned sparrows here. And so part of the robins who live in an area might stay there and be resident all year round, but other robins, other robin individuals, they'll migrate. And so that's what's called partial migration. So it's a partial in terms of the population. Part of the population migrates and part of the population doesn't. This may serve as a step in the evolution of a fully migratory habit. We don't know if the migrants survive and reproduce better than the residents do. We don't know. But anyway, so it's common enough in birds to warrant a special distinction. Um, then there's differential migration, which is done in certain species, like this dark-eyed junco here, outlined in blue. And that's where different portions of the population migrate different distances or to different areas, and often the differences are by the sexes or by age classes. And so um, in certain species, the males will flock together and they will migrate to their spot. The females are together, they migrate to their spot. In some species, the adults may migrate away from the breeding grounds first, then the juveniles, the ones that had hatched that year, then they will migrate. All of the population migrates, so it's not like partial migration. It's just that they migrate to different areas or at different times. So that's differential migration. And then finally, certain birds in certain years engage in what are called eruptive movements. And that's where um, they only migrate in certain years. Uh, the migration distances may vary among years, and it may not be true for all members of the population. And it's often common in uh, meat eaters, so predators like snowy owl, and in seed eaters like this uh, red crossbill here that specialize either on cyclic or variable uh, availabilities of prey. And so like rodents, for example, undergo these population boom busts. And seed bearing trees, conifers and oaks and so forth, they undergo masting events that also are boom and bust. And so um, when you have food shortages, it's a bust year, for example, of lemmings up in the Arctic or pine seeds up in the boreal forest, then that causes individuals to move to seek food. And this often occurs in the winter time, which is the period of greatest resource scarcity, and can lead to the sightings of species like these far, far from where you would normally see them, like around here with burrowing owls. So every few years, we'll see a burrowing owl, like there's one recently in Odessa, um, in Amarillo. They've been seen as far south as Louisiana. I mean, that's, that's wandering pretty far to try to find a bite to eat. This year, this winter, has been a very good year for crossbills here in Lubbock. Um, and it also includes things like um, common red poles and evening gross beaks and uh, red-breasted nuthatches and a bunch of other species that not every year do they do this. So they stop migrating once they find abundant food, and then they go back to their breeding grounds. And so these eruptive movements are um, sort of strange migrations that are driven by resource limitation. So these other terms over here are not the same as full-on migration, the journey and return between breeding and non-breeding grounds. So I've been talking about the breeding season and the non-breeding or wintering season. It's actually kind of a misnomer because birds are actually going sort of from summer to summer. In most cases, migration is a north to south event. It's not longitudinal, east-west so much it's north to south. And so they're often going from the northern hemisphere during times of resource, resource scarcity, winter, to south of the equator where it is summer. So they go from summer to summer, and they're kind of trying to avoid winter in a way. 
Um, and this movement, this migration, really is one of two strategies. If you're faced with a resource shortage, like seasonality, um, you can either sit and take it, or you can get out of there. And so migration is you get out of there. If you sit and take it, then that is residency. And so certain bird species are migratory, certain bird species are residents, except again for those partial migrants where there are weirdos. Um, birds that are resident have certain adaptations that allow them to withstand harsh conditions. Migrants, they have certain adaptations that allow them to undertake long distance journeys. Most birds migrate and Indeed, half of the birds that breed in North America overwinter in the tropics or the subtropics. And so these birds we call neotropical migrants. Remember that the neotropics, the New World tropics. Um, and so these are the birds of North America that are only here during the summertime that are not here in the wintertime. And so since this is spring semester and right now it is, it's going to be March, um, we're just going to start seeing these neotropical migrants as they're making their journey to their breeding grounds in North America. And it includes lots of different songbirds belonging to different families, including the Turdidae, and the Virianidae, and the Perulidae, and the Cardinalidae, and quite a number of others as well. So these are often uh, songbirds, and they're often of conservation concern. They're certainly very beautiful birds, and so these are often the focus of a lot of um, ornithologists and a lot of conservation efforts. Not every bird that migrates migrates to the tropics, so we do have some what are called short distance migrants that overwinter in North America. They breed in North America and they overwinter here, and so they include things like snow geese and burrowing owls, and so um, don't think of all migratory birds in the New World as being neotropical migrants because they aren't. So we do have some short distance migrants um, as well that don't ever visit the tropics. So why would birds do this anyway? Why do birds migrate is a huge, hugely important question in ornithology, especially given the great energetic costs of migration. Migration requires a Herculean energetic effort. So think about birds that breed in northern U.S., Canada, all the way up to Alaska. They may overwinter all the way down in the southern cone of South America. That's a distance of over 8,000 kilometers, 9,000 kilometers. That migratory trip is done quickly in a matter of days with the birds sometimes flying nonstop so for a human to match the metabolic equivalent of that, you would have to run the pace of a four minute mile. That's tough, can't do it. Most humans can't do it. Very few people have broken the four minute mile barrier. And you would have to do that for 80 consecutive hours. Completely impossible for humans, impossible for a car to match a bird's efficiency, it would have to get 720,000 miles per gallon. So these are huge costs. And so there must be huge benefits to migration to offset these costs. So the question of why birds migrate, especially for our neotropical migrants here, there are two sort of alternative hypotheses about the evolution of why migration started in the first place. And they deal with the fact that you've got differences in temperate versus tropical conditions. So these two maps here illustrate these two alternative hypotheses. For quite a while, the assumption was that birds would migrate south to avoid the harsh conditions of winter and the seasonal resource shortages that were associated with winter. And so that these were northern birds that would move south temporarily and then they would come back. So that's sort of shown here in this upper map. This is the northern home hypothesis. 
it wasn't until recently, and by recently I mean within the past mm, 20 years or so, that people really put that idea on its head and said, well, hey, wait a minute, most birds originated more centrally, remember Pangaea, and then radiated outward from the, the continents. And so most birds have a tropical evolutionary origin. And so instead of thinking of them as American birds that then go to the tropics and come back. Instead, these are tropical birds that temporarily visit us in the north. And why would they do that? Well, they do that during the peak of resource abundance, which is summer, spring and summer, when you get all of the insects, all of the flowers and seeds and all that kind of stuff, all of that food availability for predators, all the little babies are being born of little mice and, and you know rabbits and things. And so the, the thinking now is not a northern home, but rather down here, the southern home hypothesis, that really these migratory birds are southern birds that we get to borrow during our summer. They come up here to take advantage of our seasons because in the tropics and subtropics, you don't have these great periods of of great abundance and great resource scarcity because it's the tropics that's all pretty um, constant in terms of the seasonality and in terms of resource availability whereas especially the higher in latitude you go you know you get up into northern Canada and Alaska they have those very long days 24 hours of daylight in the summertime and so you get these amazingly huge pulses of insects and plant growth and all the things. And so really, these are tropical birds that are coming to take advantage of that. And then when that resource availability starts going down in what we call our winter, that's when the birds are like, okay, resources are getting scarce. I'm going to go back home. So you see how there's this difference between thinking of birds as northern going south versus thinking of birds as southern coming north. And so this southern home hypothesis is currently um, the one that ornithologists think is, is the cause of why birds migrate. It's to take advantage of seasonal pulses in resources. But not all birds migrate. You know, why don't all birds migrate? So the difference is in a, a balance between survival and your reproductive output. And so in the, the next slide, I will have this sort of comparison about the, the benefits you gain from migrating weighed against the energetic costs, that energetic cost that could go towards preserving your survival or towards reproducing more. And so if you're gonna spend that energy that you otherwise could be you know, living your best life and reproducing, then spending the energy, you must get a return somehow on either your survival or your reproduction or maybe both. And so in the thinking about the evolution of migration, southern home hypothesis or northern home hypothesis, to be honest, we need to think about the differences in survival and reproduction in birds that migrate versus ones that don't. So let me walk you through this graph. This graph depicts in two colors, darker blue and lighter blue, um, the two strategies. Remember, do I stay or do I go? So either you have to be resident, which is shown in the dark blue or short distance migrants here in the dark blue versus the long distance migrants, the neotropical migrants, and that's shown in the light blue here. So in North America, it's estimated about 4 billion birds are either resident or short distance migrants, and 4.7 billion are neotropical migrants. Okay, so of these 4 billion birds that are either short distance or resident, they don't migrate very far in comparison to the neotropical migrants. Okay, well, oddly enough, those birds that do either stay or migrate um, only a short distance most of them, not most of them, 35% of them 
actually die. And that is higher than the mortality over the non-breeding season, the winter season, that our migrants, our long distance neotropical migrants engage in. So basically, if you stay, you pay a price for this in terms of your survival. You have lower survival for those birds that don't get out of North America. Whereas if you go to the tropics, hey, the living is easy. And so your mortality during the winter is lower. And so the shorter the migration you have, which is here, the lower survivorship you have in the winter. Okay, so even though you don't spend that energy making that trip, you spend that energy in terms of reduced survival during the winter. Okay, well, that's cool. Well, they may have lower survival, but they produce more chicks. And so there's compensation for that in their reproductive output. Now, it's balanced by the fact that most of the young don't survive the journey, this journey in this arrow right here, but there's more of those chicks making that, that journey that will survive in comparison to the long distance migrants. So what this means is that the, the resident short distance migratory birds, they suffer higher mortality in the winter, but also higher reproductive output versus neotropical migrants, lower mortality in the winter, they're surviving more in the tropics, but they're producing fewer young. So these things kind of balance out the, the net losses and the net gains here. And so um, these, the birds that stay in the U.S. basically suffer higher mortality, but also higher reproductive productivity. And so the, I guess the moral of the story is there isn't just one better way of living. Both of these are viable. Both of them exert costs. For dark blue, the costs are mortality in the winter. For light blue, it's this journey right here. That journey is one that is terribly fraught with peril, where a lot of birds do not make it. And so you got to pay the price somewhere. So for those birds that make it in the winter, ah, at least higher chance of survival, and those survivors, they don't produce as many chicks as the shorter distance birds, the, the resident birds, and so it all kind of balances out, and so it's not like there's this sort of net accrual of one migratory strategy versus a net decline of the other. It's all kind of balanced like that, and that balance is the balance between survival and reproduction, and where you um, lose out on survival. Is it in the journey or is it in the winter? And so these are the two strategies. So let's talk about an example of long distance migration in a neotropical migrant. Um, this is a Hudsonian godwit. It's a member of the Shredriaformes here. And these are birds that breed up here in Alaska and they overwinter all the way down here at the southern tip of South America. And a lot of the information that we have on migration in birds can come from uh, catch and, and release in terms of tagging. So the birds are captured, they're fitted with either a band, um, a radio tag, or now more sophisticatedly, a geolocator, which you can think of as like a GPS unit. And you can see one here um, on this bird's leg, and it can give more precise information about um, that bird's location. And so here's an example of some of these um, Hudsonian godwits that were captured and fitted with these geolocators on their breeding grounds in um, southern Alaska. The interesting thing is that these birds take different routes on their spring migration heading north versus their fall migration heading south. So that's, that's super interesting. So let's start with, okay, a bird has bred and now that was the summertime and now fall is happening. Okay, the days are getting short. Okay, time for me to migrate. So we're doing fall migration first. These birds kind of spread out and these sort of pinkish lines are the, um, the migratory routes that are, are taken. And they kind of sort of, you know, trickle out and fan out and leave out and da 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 and then they gather. And you can see 
these kinds of gathering concentrations where they sort of flock together in what are called staging areas before they then attempt their long distance migration. So some people make a distinction between staging areas and stopover sites, and some people consider them to be um, synonymous. A staging area is generally an area where lots of birds gather in order to prepare for migration. Stopover sites tend to be, oftentimes you can think of them as like little short rest stops, and staging areas is more like a nice sit down restaurant. You spend more time there. So both have resources that the birds need in order to fuel up and rest up before their journey. Okay, so these birds have bred, they gather on the staging areas and they start to feed and fatten up to get ready to migrate. So then during fall migration, they migrate over the Atlantic Ocean, the open ocean, and the first main source of land that they hit in South America is up here in Venezuela. And so that's the first land they hit. Whew, got to take a rest and have something to eat. And so they don't spend very long at these stopover sites. These are just quick little areas where they gather some resources and then, okay, let's go. And so they then fly over the Amazon. They stop again to kind of get a last little bit of energy, a last little bit of snack before they make it to their wintering grounds. And so finally, they've accrued. They spend the winter down there. Okay, hey, the days are getting longer. It's time for me to migrate north again. Instead of following that same route back, check this out. They fly over the Pacific Ocean and then fly over us until they get to the area. These are shorebirds, remember, shradriaformes. They get to the area of the playas. And these playas are very important stopover and staging areas for lots and lots of shorebirds and also lots and lots of waterfowl and cranes and so forth. So, this area here, their staging area, and then finally they make their last little bit on spring migration back to their breeding grounds here. So point of this slide is, there are several points of this slide. First, birds can undertake long distance migration. We can know where they go through technology that we deploy with them. They may take different routes, spring and fall, and then there are these areas that are staging or stopover sites. Some people are, consider them to be synonymous. Some people consider these to be longer term, these to be shorter term. Regardless, you got to have good resources at these sites. And so in our area, the Playa Lakes area is extremely important migratory stopover site for literally millions of birds. And so in our area, that is the main reason why we have migratory birds in our area is because of these wetlands and the resources that they provide. Okay, so what controls the timing of migration anyway? In other words, what makes a bird say, okay, time for me to head south or time for me to head north? Um, and there is precise timing to this because many birds are known to arrive in a given area in a very precise date. Um, so, for example, I'll send a video of the, um, the swallows of Capistrano, the cliff swallows that traditionally return to San Juan Capistrano in California every March 19th, give or take 24 to 48 hours on either side. They've flown for thousands of miles and they always seem to arrive around March 19th. So that means that there is very precise timing that is guiding migration. They also depart generally on a very precise schedule as well. They all depart around October 23rd. So clearly there is something that is timing migration in these birds and in, in different individuals and in different species to try to synchronize them. <clears throat> in discussing what controls the timing of migration, I need to make a distinction between ultimate controls and proximal controls or approximate controls. And so the example I like to give is this. So imagine a, a celebrity like Beyonce 
driving down the road. And unbeknownst to her, there is a car coming in the opposite direction that has been that's being driven by somebody who's had too much to drink. And that person veers over the center line and hits Beyonce's car head on and kills her. Now, because she's a mega celebrity, this is huge news, right? And so what are the headlines going to say the next day? Drunk driver kills Beyonce. But is that the cause of death that's going to be listed on the medical examiner's death certificate? No, it's not. It's going to be something like, I don't know, head trauma or thoracic compression or, you know, something like that. So the ultimate cause of death was the drunk driver. But the proximal cause was the crash, the compression of the, the, the thoracic cavity, the head, or whatever. Okay? So the ultimate cause of migration in birds is day length or photo period. Photo, light, period, period of time. And so how long do you have light? That's day length. That's the ultimate cause. And so birds can sense the days are getting longer, the days are getting shorter. And so once you sort of hit this critical period of, okay, hey, the days are long enough, okay, time for me to migrate, then the proximal control is weather. So if there is a headwind, birds may decide to delay. Or if it's raining, they may decide to delay. And then that temporary weather thing goes and it's like, okay, time to go. So ultimately, birds are driven by day length. They sense the changes in day length. And then the proximal controls are, do you have good weather conditions? Like, do you have a nice tailwind? Is it a nice, you know, clear day? So the weather is the proximal controls. Um, and as you might imagine, the ultimate control, day length, day length changes with the seasons. And so that is a very faithful cue that the seasons are changing and hey, there's either fixing to be a shortage in resources or hey, there's fixing to be a pulse in resources. That is much less fickle than the weather. Certainly as we know here, you can have a beautiful, nice day in the 70s, even in the wintertime. And you can have a very cold, chilly day, even below freezing, in the spring. So weather is a little bit more fickle. Photo period or day length is more constant, more reliable, I should say. And so that's why that is the ultimate cue, um, because it tracks long-term trends that indicates seasonal pulses in resource availability versus something that changes on a more day-to-day -day basis. When I talk about reproduction, I'll actually talk about the hormonal cascade that photoperiod triggers because that it's also the ultimate cue for reproduction. Um, suffice it to say that it is under hormonal control, that you have photosensors, photoreceptors in the bird's eye and the brain that detect, hey, the days are getting longer, that starts a hormonal cascade that gets them ready to migrate. And in reproduction, that's manifested in the growth of the gonads. So y'all know that birds have the growth and the shrinkage and the, then the recrudescence of the gonads. In migration, it triggers what's called Zugenruhe. This is a German term. Um, Germany was and is one of the leading areas for avian research. And so this was a term that was first um, coined by Germans. And so in honor, it is still used, this German term. It roughly translates to migratory restlessness. You start getting spring fever. You start getting itchy feet. You gotta get out of here. So that Zugenruhe manifests in captive birds as they get kind of itchy and twitchy and they often face in the correct direction, like north in the springtime or south in the fall for migration. And actually the next lecture I cover, I will talk much, much more about this because I'll be talking about orientation and navigation in birds. So that Zugenruhe is what 
um, is manifested in terms of this, okay, I got to get ready to go. Okay, I need to prepare. I need to eat. Okay, I need to orient myself. Time to go. This website that I have here just is an illustration of the differences in daylight with the seasons with your position on the globe. So you can check this out here. Okay, so the bird has sensed the changing in photo period and they've got Zugenruhe. They've got this migratory restlessness that indicates they're getting into a state of preparedness to migrate. And there are sort of two major alternative strategies of how birds go about doing this. These two strategies vary by species. So a species is either one or the other. One strategy, I call it the dawdler strategy. You leave early and you kind of piddle your way along. And you just eat and snack at your stopover sites during your journey. And so you're kind of taking it um, leisurely, if you will. The other strategy I call the procrastinator strategy. They wait until the last minute. They leave later, in other words, they leave after the dawdlers do. And instead of them having the luxury of being able to stop and feed on the way there, they have to pig out and put on fat before they depart. Because once they depart, they don't stop. They fatten through engaging what's called hyperphagy, hyper more phage to eat. And so this is sort of this frantic eating and fat deposition that happens. And so you can either sort of leave early and you're not fat and you just kind of eat your way down or you wait until the last minute and then, oh crap, I better eat and then go and I can't stop. So these are the two major alternative migratory strategies in birds. So let's look at this on a timeline. So I've, I've drawn a timeline here as this horizontal line. And the goal is to arrive at your breeding grounds early enough to where you can pick the best territory, get yourself settled and set in. You can't be too early because remember, this is driven by resource availability. And so you don't want to arrive before your resources are ready. So there is this finite, small arrival window of time. Let's say it's the third week in May. That is the ideal time. It's not too early, but it's not too late for you to arrive. Okay? Well, your dawdlers, they depart early. And they kind of doodle 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 their way along. At some point, very close to the due date, that's when the procrastinators, they depart. They both arrive around that same time. And so the end result of both of these strategies, they, it gets the different species to where they need to be. They just do so in two different fashions. And so for these two strategies, the end result for both of them is that whether you're a dawdler species or a procrastinator species, you both wind up at the breeding grounds about the same time, and they both wind up with the same amount of body fat. For a bird that is a dawdler, like, for example, this yellow rump warbler here, um, what they're doing is they've parted the feathers, and you, you often do that by blowing to part the feathers so that you can examine the breast. And you can see the reddish muscle and the keel right there on this bird. And I can see just a little bit of this yellowish fat that is deposited right up here in the notch of the throat in this bird. So this bird doesn't have a lot of fat on it. This bird has doodle -doodle 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 dawdled its way down and stopped and eaten a little bit along the way. This bird over here is a black pole warbler. And all of this yellowish stuff, that is fat. It's so fat you can't even see the breast muscle underneath it. These guys, they undertake this very massive, quick, get there and get it done journey over the Atlantic Ocean. So they don't even have the luxury of being able to stop. They have to engage in hyperphagy and put this fat on. They burn through that fat. And so when they arrive on their breeding, on their wintering grounds, 
they look just like the yellow rope warbler. They have burned through all of this fat. And so the birds wind up with the same amount of body fat once they arrive. And so it really is two alternative fine ways of getting done what needs to get done. Fat is fuel, but there is this fine line between having too much fuel, too much weight, and not enough and not letting you get to your journey, your, your destination. So there's this sort of delicate balance. Um, fat is flight ballast, and so you can have too much of it to be an efficient flyer. And so Birds that migrate, especially those um, they are at the end of their journey, um, or if they have hit a headwind, a weather front, um, that makes their flight less efficient because they're fighting the wind now. That causes them to burn that fat and run out of gas before they get to their destination. And so just as you perhaps have had to make a stop at a sketchy gas station or a sketchy restaurant that you wouldn't otherwise have patronized, but you got to do it because your car is out of gas and you are starving, birds do the same thing. And many times they will land in places where they don't really want to be here, but they're out of gas and out of fuel and they need to rest and refuel. This phenomenon is called fallout in birds. It happens when um, they, they hit a headwind on migration. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that often happens like during spring migration where you get these low fronts, these cold fronts that come down from the north and that you know meets the birds that are migrating north from the south. And for birds that have been traveling over water, like the Gulf of Mexico, for example, then they will land on literally the first bit of land that they get to, and they often do so in spectacular numbers. So these two photographs here, you can see all of these, so many of these are common yellow throats here, but there's others here. That's a, that's a Cape May warbler. There's other species in here. And then down here, obviously this is the same staircase, you can see all of these birds, this is at a lighthouse. So the first bit of land that these birds encountered. And clearly, they, they don't want to be here um, on the steps. They don't want to be on the ground where they can be easy pickings. True fallouts are rare, thankfully, um, because the birds are terribly vulnerable at this stage. Um, during spring, a lot of birders are watching the weather kind of um, very intently, looking for these fronts that be coming down that might cause a fallout of birds. And so a lot of birders will go to the coast during these events. And the weather may be crummy, you know, it may be raining on you, but the birding can be unbelievable and actually heartbreaking at the same time because the birds lack the energy to get out of your way. You have to watch where you step in some cases because the birds are exhausted. You have to think about how many individuals didn't make it. Untold numbers that would have perished in the Gulf of Mexico because they ran out of fuel. So true fallouts are rare, thankfully. Um, but they are spectacular and heart-wrenching events when they do occur. There's a website that has been built that you can consult as birdcast.info, and they make these maps. Um, on the website, the maps um, are animated, and you can see for different species dates, and these are, are you can think of them as like heat maps, where the white is that's where you got a lot of birds. And then this gray is there are no birds. And then the orange is there are some birds. And so for barn swallows, for example, these are birds that they need to get the heck out of here because they're insectivores. 
And so a lot of them have already made it all the way down here into South America, but some of these, most of them in fact, they're here in the U.S., in Mexico, and in Central America. And so October, they're sort of mm, getting to midway point in their migratory journey. And so a lot of times birders will also be watching BirdCast. And what BirdCast also can do is indicate peak flight days. Um, and actually, one of the next slides I'll get to, we're really looking at peak flight nights. And they ask that people um, actually turn off their lights, any excess outdoor lights that you don't need to have on turn them off so that the birds don't become sort of disoriented because they're running on such a tight metabolic envelope and they don't have a whole lot of extra fuel, regardless of whether they're a dawdler or a procrastinator. And so you don't want to have to make them make any unnecessary detours. And so this bird cast, it's like bird forecast, is a really neat website. For millennia, people wondered where birds went in the autumn and from whence they came when they appeared in the spring. And, and while some flocks were seen during the day, um, especially of large birds like hawks and cranes and storks, um, things like that, um, those small flocks didn't explain these sort of sudden, I wake up and, oh my gosh, look at all the birds that are here. Um, they appear as if out of nowhere. Well, as it turns out, most birds migrate at night. And so this is a very famous um, piece of art by Charlie Harper, who was a, a wonderful illustrator of um, the natural world. And he has this very characteristic style of art, had this char characteristic style of art. He's deceased now. And this is um, one of his pieces of art. There's the, the slender moon right there indicating these are all of the species um, that, not even all of them, but this is a great selection of the species that migrate primarily, if not solely, at night. Think about it, it's cooler at night and you're exerting yourself tremendously in flight. And so it's nice to, to have cooler weather so that you don't um, get overheated during this extreme exertion. There's typically less wind to interfere with flight and certainly you're less visible to predators. However, um, remember when I talked about the physics of flight? Uh, birds that are heavy bodied, that use thermals, they can't rely on this strategy because thermals form in the heat of the day. And so that's why a lot of the big bodied birds, the hawks, the cranes, the storks, and so forth, they typically migrate uh, during the day. So nocturnal migration, that is the, the mystery of the missing migrants, they're at night. The development of radar originally for uh, military purposes and then later for meteorological purposes has really contributed to our knowledge about migration. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the use of radar in ornithology was originally pioneered by a faculty member at Clemson University in South Carolina named Sidney Gotro. And uh, Sydney used radar um, when you would see these odd signals like this that you would think, oh, it's raining, but there was no rain that was reported. Huh, what is this odd anomaly? That odd anomaly is a flock of birds, a dense flock of birds that is getting picked up on radar. And so he has used radar to quantify the number and the density and the size of these flocks flying over the Gulf of Mexico. He has sadly found that the number of these flocks, the size of these flocks, and the density of these flocks has been declining um, since the 1950s by over 50 percent. So that means that half of the birds that the numbers of birds that used to migrate, only half of them are still around to do so. We have lost a large number of birds. Some species have gone extinct, but even for those species that have not, 
there are fewer individuals in those species that show up as these dense items on radar. So next time I'll be talking about how birds know how to orient themselves, like north in the spring and south in the, in the fall, and then how they actually navigate, it's especially at night because it's dark. Um, but this map shows that for North America, there are, there are generally four major flyways, they're called um, flyways, highways, haha. -ha. And you can see that Texas, we're in the central migratory bird flyway, that different species typically take one of these four major routes here. And so during uh, spring, perhaps they take the central and during fall, they may take the Pacific or they may take the same one spring and fall. But these are big areas where birds are funneled north and south during um, their migration. And so how they can make that journey, not get lost, and make it within that finite window of time and arrive, you know, within a day, give or take 24 to 48 hours at the same time, that takes some pretty sophisticated navigational skills. And so that's what I'll be talking about in the next lecture. And so here's your QR code uh, for today.